Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project, I should say a long-awaited project update video for the 1.6 scale Cadillac Gauge V100 armor car, also known as the M706. Since the last video update, the most obvious and prominent addition that's been mounted to the model is with the turret. The turret is back from the printer. It's been assembled, painted, weathered, and fitted in place. Outside of the turret, I also went ahead and completed the last of the external fittings that were remaining in order to get this model up to this point here. And what that point is, well, this model now is finally ready for painting. Yes, we finally hit that milestone. So there's going to be a bunch of really cool info coming right at you. So sit back and enjoy. If you're a fan of the V100 armor car or just Vietnam War military vehicles in general, this is definitely a video I think you're going to enjoy. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and kick this one off. And this is a sight for some definite sore eyes. If you've been following this build from the beginning, I'm pretty sure this is going to be a bit of equipment that you've been eagerly awaiting to see exactly how it was going to tackle it. Well, here's the day. It finally came. Here we have the parts directly from the printer. Let's go. Sitting on the table is the turret that's going to be mounted to this vehicle, which is known as the M50 turret. The M50 turret was a Cadillac gauge product, which was actually sold separately and was something that was available as an option for lots of other military vehicles on the market. One quick example was with the M113, and the Australians did actually mount these onto their M113s that saw service in Vietnam, but that's a topic for another video for another day. The components that we have here on the table, like I said before, are freshly arrived from the printer and these are going to be a brand new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com catalog. Unfortunately, you only see about three quarters of the set right here on the table. There are going to be more components that are going to be supplied with the set, but these are still in production and are going to be mentioned at a future update video that's going to be around the corner. Trust me, I do have those parts that are on the way and they once they are fitted to the turret, they're definitely going to finish it off. But I think we could go ahead and really get a good idea more or less on what the set does give you. So really quick, the components are all 3D printed. The 3D printing that are utilized on these parts are different compared to the standard white nylon material that I've touched upon on a number of builds already. This is from that other vendor that I've mentioned briefly and the manufacturing technique is different compared to the SLS method that I typically use on my 3D printed parts. As for the manufacturing process, honestly I couldn't tell you, but I will say that the quality on the components are excellent judging from the other components that I've already touched upon before. So the set that you see here basically comprises of three components. We have the armament, we have the main turret, and we also have the interior bits. All of the mentioned components are made from 3D print. Some are going to be made out of different com or materials compared to others. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with the major component, which is the main turret itself. Just like what we see on many of the other EastCoastArmory.com components, this is encompassing as many components as possible as a single print. Because of this, this greatly cuts down the complexity of the component, as well as also the parts count required for the set. This is really taking advantage of the technology that we have currently with manufacturing components, compared to if this was manufactured in the era that preceded, this would have to be all cast rest and there would be a gazillion components in order to flesh this thing out. But just like with the trailer and with the M40 and the M27, I was able to condense as much detail as possible on one single printing. So the turret itself, as you can see, it's quite substantial in size. Here's my hand and here's the actual turret. The turret features as much exterior detailing as possible. And this would include the cutouts here for the periscopes. All of the weld beads are integrally printed on for the frames here of the periscopes. We also have the weld beads around the sections over here, along the entire portion of the turret. And even the bottom portion of the turret has its weld bead as well, and it goes all the way around. Also found on the external printing are these holes that are found right over here. This was heavily inspired from the real V100 that I had the opportunity to study. And this is true for not just the exterior, but also you'll see it on the interior when I go ahead and go over that in more depth. Some other details to mention on the exterior is the optic. 
where we even have the inner optic detailing right over here, as well as the brush guard. Well beads are present as well. And note the shape of the geometry here on the optic. Also on the top, we have what should be eyelets. Now, for some reason, this vendor cracked those sections off. I'm going to go ahead and make note of that so that when the units go into their, or when the units are actually produced, these here should more or less be something that he doesn't overzealously snip off, but this is something that remains to be seen. On this model over here, the eyelets are really easily fabricated. I can just bend them out of some wire and, you know, call it a day by the most part. On the back portion over here, we do have the hinge for the hatch. Again, well beads are integrally printed on. As is the torsion bar sleeve. On the front portion over here, we do have the bump stop, which on the real unit is welded to the bottom portion. Yes, those details are present. And there is going to be a little rubber cup that or it's rubber on the real one but here it's just gonna be standard material but there's a spring and a little like doorstop type setup that, that's going to be fit into this section over here and this is going to be added as the unit progresses on the top portion we have this little gutter section and it does have the little split line right over here as it was found on the real unit before I go over the interior, one thing I do want to mention is that this unit did arrive somewhat cracked just from the shipping. It wasn't anything major. I was able to glue it back together. It cracked in these two locations over here with a little bit of super glue. The unit was refused, and I'm just going to polish these sections out with some sandpaper momentarily. But on this section here, there's a small little chip. This is going to be plugged up and blended in with the red putty, and I'll, I will be touching upon that later on but you know regardless this one here is more than salvageable for the project in hand on the interior portion this is where really the rubber hits the road and this is where the majority of the work on this project was definitely focused on so starting with the top portion here we have a headrest that runs all the way around the portion here of the hatch opening it has a gap found in this section over here which is true to form and we even had little flange detailing and the mounting fastener detailing present on all these mounting straps on the mid section over here we have a little bent plate that's welded on and this is actually the same type of detail that's found on other hatches on this vehicle and it's for the latch to to actually lock into and it prevents it from over swinging due to the geometry of course, every section on the inside is welded and painstakingly welded, I might add. That was a lot of time spent doing that, but regardless, it's definitely going to pan out because it looks absolutely exquisite. On this portion, we have a plate running from the top and the bottom, and the same thing is found right over here on the rear. And from what I was told by the owner of the real vehicle is that this was done in order to protect some of the welded sections so that if a bullet hits or a round hits this section over here and it starts to crack, it's going to prevent some shrapnel from busting off on the inside and, you know, potentially entering inside the vehicle. So that was done by Cadillac Gage and you know it's a very interesting bit of detail and it transferred over into this model here. What's also interesting to point out is only found these two sections on the interior portion of the turret. I presume this is where the two sections were probably welded in place. On the rear portion over here we have this little lug and you'll actually see it continued right here on the outside and this is actually for a knob that gets fitted into this section and the knob is actually what's used to keep the hatch in the open position and prevents it from closing down hitting the operator on the head which is definitely a good thing I'm not getting hit on the head but I'm talking about the locking mechanism but you'll see what that looks like as the unit progresses on the side portions over here we do have the vision block mounts Clear pieces of plastic are going to be fitted to this section over here in order to fulfill the prism detailing, but this is something that's going to be added as the build goes on. All of the wraparound details are present, as well as the well beads. Moving on downward takes us to the turret ring, and as you can see, the geared tooth ring is right here running along the side, and this just oozes with detail fidelity. On this portion over here and this portion we have two little backrests and these are just there so that the operator can lean on something without interfering with the gear 
portion that we have right over here. Also on the real vehicle, there would be a leather or some kind of a pad found in these two locations and these are going to be supplied with the set. The reason why they're not found on this model over here is because those were being printed in a rubber material just to make the the piece just that much more accurate. Regrettably, the rubber components are currently still in manufacture, but you know, I'll be mentioning those in a later upcoming video that has the unit fully fleshed out. But aside from the backrest, the backrest mounts are here and they have the correct shape to them as per the real unit I was studying. On this portion over here, we have the turret rotation gearbox and the gearbox on this unit was hand cranked. And I gotta say the gearing was really, really good because this thing can just pivot like almost on the dime and with hardly any effort required. They really knew what they were doing. And the gearbox mechanism is all lifted again from the real example. You can see down here the countersunk Allen fasteners, which are used to secure this plate in place. You can actually see the rotation gear right there. Hopefully it comes out on camera, but right inside here we have the actual rotation gear present. We have here a little pad just to protect your elbows from winging on these metal corners, which would definitely hurt and would suck pretty bad. The pad is on a plate that's bolted to the side here of the gearbox. And on the top portion, we also have a crank wheel. The crank wheel has its little knob right there. All the details are present. And even the knob's little retention pin is found on the component as well. Not to mention the little braces that are found on the wheel itself. And, rem and remember, everything you see here is integrally printed as a single printing. No assembly needs to be done by the builder. You just have to carefully paint everything and you're basically all there. There is another wheel that descends from this section over here that cracked off, but I have it right there on the table and I'll be showing it momentarily. Of course, the most interesting and noteworthy aspect of the interior is the gunner's position. And this was really a labor of love. This is basically what took the majority of the time when it came time to design the component over here and it was definitely worth it. This was all in part due to the excellent reference photographs I was able to take of the real example of the V100 and all that was able to transfer down into the 1.6 scale model that we have here. So first thing I am going to mention is the optic. As you can see, it is in line with the one here on the exterior portion. And every little facet of detailing, every piece of the geometry, every little bolt and screw was again taken from the real example that I use as research. So what's really interesting about the optic on the V100 is that the armaments right over here, and this is actually transversed by hand, and this transfers over via a bunch of linkages into the optic, and this is controlled, or I should say connected to the reticle that's found on the inside. So when you move the unit up and down, even though this optic here does not move, the internal reticles are all in line with one another, and you can actually aim the armament with some pretty good effect. On the model over here, the linkages are all for looks. They are not functional, but they do definitely give you the overall look and feel of the units in question. The optics will have their lenses on both the interior and exterior. These are being printed in clear HD material, and this is something that is going to be referenced in another video because those are just like with the rubber parts currently not yet in hand. On the exterior portion of the optic, there is a on the real units, a glass piece found in this section over here, and there's a flange with a bunch of fasteners that hold it in place. All of these details are found on the ECA component, but are, again, are integrally printed on the clear piece, and this is something that I'm going to be referencing in a later date. Also, it's found on the interior. It's one of the most noteworthy things I personally remember on the inside was a very interesting shaped eye cup, which is made out of rubber on the real unit, and the 3D printed one is on its way, and this too is made out of a rubber material, Again, just to squeeze as much accuracy out of the part as possible. Back to the optic that we have here. Like I stated before, every little bit of detailing that I was able to see on the real unit transferred over onto this piece here. And you can see that with the way this back plate here is designed and how it's actually rendered with small little fasteners connecting to the main body. We have this dome shaped object over here. It replicates the stamped section found on the real unit. And yes, the little Phillips head fasteners are integrally printed on. On this side over here, you can see this 
tube-like structure. On the real unit, there are wires that come out of this, and this is something that I am going to be adding to the to the build, and I will be touching upon that later on. But it has the mounting rings, the stamp sheet metal bracket, the fasteners, and even the... <laughs> On the real one, there is an Allen wrench found right over here that's clipped in. It's really hard to get on screen. It's going to be even harder for me to paint it, but there's a little Allen wrench that's actually clipped into the section, and that detailing is integrally printed on this unit right here. On this side, we have the linkages, and this was very, very fun to design in CAD. And you can see all of the linkages with the little slot details, their fastener details, everything is just present. And the linkages actually are reinforced by the top roof section, and that is on a bracket that's welded to the roof. The entire optic is fastened to the roof via fasteners, and yes, they are all there. In fact, this entire tube structure is actually sandwiched between the fasteners that are used to secure the optic to the top portion of the turret. And that all transfers over into the piece here, although it's probably really difficult to see. You can see how the connection bars go to this area over here, which would connect to the mantlet on the real unit. But here you get to see all that. We also have all the other bits of equipment that would be connected to the mantlet on the actual unit. And it's all just jam-packed with a ton of detailing. It's going to look great once the interior is painted and weathered. On this section over here is where the mantle goes. And we do have these various sections that are strips. And they're fastened in place with some fasteners. We even have some rivet detailing here. I believe these are for the tarpaulin or some kind of a weather stripping type material. But regardless, they are present on the ETA piece. With the turret out of the way, this leads us to the mantlet. And here you get to see the mantlet in full view. The mantlet is actually fairly uh, simplistic. There aren't really any type of fancy mounts found on the exterior. On several vehicles, there would be a rubberized tarpaulin found in this section over here, but this model's rendering without the tarpaulin present. And that's why, by the way, we have this strip running along this portion here of the exterior. This is where the tarpaulin would be connected in place if it was present. On the piece here, you can see the well beads that are integrally printed on. And we have some internal flange detailing as well. On the interior portion, we have here these two mounting flanges. And what's interesting to point out is that this turret was very adaptable to a wide range of weapon systems. From the M73 like I have here, to the M2HB. There are just anything that you could fit into this section over here can be mounted and often were in field. On this portion over here, you'll see a little square that's emitting from the side, and it's actually welded in place. And sadly, this is for a bit of equipment that's absent on the table right now, and the printer is currently printing out one because I notified him. And there is an arm that connects to this section here, comes out, bends down with a little dog leg, it has a little handle on the end with two little guards. And this is what's used to elevate and depress the unit, and I believe it also has a solenoid on it so that you could actually fire the main armament. But again, sadly, it's not present on table right now, but it will be fitted once the unit does finally arrive. On this section over here, let's go ahead and start with the bottom crank wheel. Like I said before, this is supposed to be found in this section of the gearbox, but it cracked off during shipping. Just like with the other bits here, it does have all of the appropriate detailing found. Like the center knob, the little handle. The handle does have the appropriate geometry for this piece, as does the rest of the geometry present on this section. Nice little crank wheel. And this takes us to the interior, or just the hatch itself. So the hatch on the on the M50 tart was very unique with its shape. Had this really, like, high angle ramp to it right over here. More than likely this was to give extra headroom on the inside, but also it does help with deflection of rounds due to its shape. It does have several facets of it, and these are all welded together. Now the real unit is actually one solid piece that's stamped into its appropriate shape and then the welds were just added just to seal everything up and for it to hold it the, the current shape and you can see hopefully the welds all coming out on screen you have two weld beads right here on this side of the on either side of the hatch we have the remainder of the weld beads that just follow the remainder of the geometry here you can see the hinges right here 
Well beads, of course, are present. And the well beads are also found on the inside as well. Also on the inside, you get to see the lug here for the locking lever, which I'll touch in a moment. And this here is actually a mounting strap so that you have a canvas strap that comes down and you can actually grab it and pull this thing closed. On the hatch itself, you can see the torsion bar mount. And it has the cover cap right over there with its mounting fasteners present. And that's all there really is to mention about the hatch. And here you get to see the remaining of the details. So on the opposite side of the hinge, we have the, the other end cap. This is a separate printing because there is going to be a metal rod that's going to be used to connect everything together. And this is just used to cap it in place. So you get the detailing, but you also have the metal rod on the inside that actually is what gives this thing its hinged capabilities. Just like with the other components, this thing is fully detailed with all of its faster details that are present. Hopefully they come out on camera. The next thing we have here is the internal lock knob, which is going to be located in this section right here when the time does come. This here is that rubber doorstop looking like object, which is going to be fitted right here. Basically like that. And there's going to be a metal spring that's going to be fabricated and fitted in place, and you'll see what that looks like once everything's painted. And finally, we have the locking latch. This is the same exact design that was used on all the other hatches found on this vehicle. It's just, you know, stamp sheet metal to the appropriate shape, and, uh, you know, it does the job pretty well. We do have a little retention nut right over here that once it secures in place, the lever is going to be fully functional as it is on the other hatches found on this vehicle. The very last thing to mention are the actual armament themselves. And here we have the M73s. And this was something I've been eagerly waiting on video now forever. These were actually designed almost when I first started this project, almost a year or so, or maybe a year and a half ago. And uh, they were extremely detailed. I really did have a lot of fun designing this component. The M73 is the <laughs> Browning M1919's failed red-headed step cousin. And, but that doesn't change the fact that it's just a really interesting and bizarre looking weapon. The M73 was unique because it was purpose built for vehicle use. And this was so that you can actually change the feed mechanism. So it could feed either from the right or left hand side. For an infantry weapon, it's not really relevant. But for a vehicle weapon, this is definitely important. Specifically if you're mounting it in a turret like this one over here. And you'll notice that on this vehicle here, we have both left and right hand versions of this system. This unit is extremely detailed. It's actually probably the first time I went ahead and tooled up the browning style of cooling shroud, which is something that I rinse, wash, and repeated on a number of different uh, systems. Like, for instance, my M1919 barrel sets I recently released, as well as also the 116 scale 1919s that I've also mentioned in several of my 116 Sherman videos. Just wait with those other sets, the unit is fully perforated, and we do have the inner barrel detailing that is present. On the front end, we do have all the appropriate geometry, including the wrench slits, which are found right here on either side of the barrel jacket. We have here the conical flash suppressor, an iconic bit of detailing found on the M73. Later on, the same or a similar type design would be utilized on the 1919, but that's a topic for another video. But you get to see what it looks like. It does have a hex nut type feature on it, and this is how you would thread it into the section here and tighten it down. The flash suppressor does have the appropriate geometry where the section has another cone that's in this portion here and then it widens out fully. The unit, of course, is fully rendered drilled out. And we even have the feed mechanism found on the inside. And on the top portion, you can see the, the top cover detailing, including a little button right over here that helps with the unit being able to be disassembled. We have these two little pins right here on either side and the entire unit can actually pivot out of the way so you get access to the barrel for maintenance. And because the unit can be either left or right hand side, we have two of these little spring pins in place and the detailing is present with little rings found on them as well as the little catches. The front portion here, you can have that little cutout which is present on the real unit. 
as well as these two little tabs. These little tabs here are used to switch over the charging handle plate from either left or right hand side, depending on how it's configured. And also you can see the feed paw mechanism found right there on the top cover, along with that little flared metal plate, which helps with the rounds with their feeding. On this side here, you can see the, what it looks like. Basically how we have two of those lugs in place, as well as that little oval cut found right there on the side of the receiver. And the same is also true for the opposite side, only here we have the channel that's fitted in place that holds the charging handle and the charging handle chain. Note how it secures to these two lugs and how you would be able to switch to the opposite side. There is a tech manual or a tech video on YouTube that shows the official army maintenance video for one of these. And it's really cool to watch exactly how this thing would work. The top cover here actually hinges to the side, very different from the, the Brownings where it opens topward. But again, this was done for space saving. All of the hinge detailing is present on the model over here. All the rivets are present levers, everything. On the back portion over here is where we have the solenoid as well as the manual trigger. Trigger is like a Browning M2 where it's just a, pl a little pad right over here. It is knurled. It's a little tricky to get on camera, but this will definitely pop up swimmingly once everything is painted and weathered. And we also have the bottom detailing over here and even the bolt and carrier detailing found on the inside. Right now you do have this little shaped object. This is the charging handle. On the real unit this year, I should say on the way the kit is designed, you actually snip this off and then there is a length of supply chain that is supplied with the model and this connects to that chain giving you the accurate uh, accuracy of the charging handle. The chain is going to be added momentarily but this is what it looks like straight from the printer. On this portion over here, this is the solenoid right over here. That's what this wire is for. And we also have this little bracket and this is actually for a buttstock attachment as this unit did have the capability to be mounted on a cradle with a buttstock on and you can actually use it as a traditional MG but this wasn't really done. There are some cool photographs of it. Perhaps I might make this at some point in time but for the time being this is purely going to be utilized in its vehicle format. So like I said before this can be either left or right hand feed and here goes the feed for the version on the opposite side. Obviously, it is the exact same detailing as this one. It's just a mirror image. Once fitted to the uh, to the mantlet, it will basically look like this. So you would, on the real unit, there are some locking lugs, and these locking lug details are present on the unit. However, for the model over here, they just slide directly into place with no fuss and no muss. And there we have it. Once everything is positioned and secured in place permanently, it'll definitely have the appropriate look that we're looking for. And it'll be even cooler once we have the chains hooked up, but you'll see what that looks like momentarily. In addition to the clear and the rubber bits, another bit of equipment that's going to be supplied with the sets is a retention ring. And that's why we have this long neck that we have here. This is so it can plug onto the vehicle and whatever's left is going to have a ring that slips over it, securing the turret in place. This will allow the turret to rotate freely, but it'll prevent it from being able to be removed from the model just by lifting up on it. This is something that's being printed in a different material. And I will be touching upon that in another video for the time being though, I should have everything I need though, just to get this thing painted, weathered, and then, partially fitted in place, but you'll definitely see what it looks like once mounted on the model. Another bit of detailing that's going to be supplied with the sets is some clear Lexan plastic for the use of the prisms and windows. I did touch upon that before, but also there will be some 3D printed locking tabs for the periscopes. These are very similar to the ones that are going to be used on the hull. In fact, here I have the hull plate right over here. So basically it's going to have the exact same type of features that this one has more or less and then they're going to be mounted into these two locations but these are going to be added of course after the model's fully painted and then the periscopes get fitted in place but again more information on that is to come so with all of that out of the way it's now time for the rubber to truly hit the road and get this thing fitted to the armored car as i've mentioned before when this model was originally built all those years ago the original builder went ahead and scratch built his own m50 turret and the way he attached it to the model is as follows. He basically drilled a hole right here in the middle. And then he added two little cutouts where he had two little bolts that acted as a retention lug. Much along the lines you see on like a 135th scale model. Overall, good design. You know, nothing really there to complain about. 
But obviously the turret hole here needs to be revised in, in order for it to fit the new one. It's not really going to work. So I'm going to have to carefully mark exactly where does this thing need to go because you need to have the alignment set just right or else you're going to be in for a world of hurt. And the alignment needs to be set both vertically as well as laterally as well. And this is going to take some clever math in order to figure out and to make sure that everything is where it needs to be because this is one of those things where you really only have one shot at getting it right. Otherwise, it's just going to open up Pandora's box of a bunch of problems. So let's go ahead and skip to where that has already been taken care of. And I, what I mean by that is the actual alignment. So here's the top deck now with the turret location all marked out. Careful measurements were definitely taken and retaken to make sure everything is where it needs to be. Obviously the crosshead section is the part that needs to go. To do this I'm going to be utilizing the Dremel. I'll start with a router bit to remove the majority of the material and then the remaining material is going to be removed with a high speed removal bit. Jumping forward a little bit takes us to the M73s now fully ready for painting. In order to get the units prepped, what you have to do is you have to snip off the charging handle which is integrally printed on the bottom over here at the injection port and then affix it to the side of the receiver with a length of chain like you see here. The chain is supplied with the ECA sets as is the little bit of floor wire which is used to hinge everything together. I gotta say, once everything is fully assembled, I absolutely love the aesthetics of the M73. Yes, the unit, mechanically speaking, was a complete train wreck, but at least the thing looked good, right? There's something about the Browning-type front end with that cool flash suppressor, that small little receiver, and that really cool, and, my, and probably my favorite part, which is the chain-retained charging handle. I love this, this system because of that. But regardless, uh, back to the unit itself here. These are going to be painted in the usual form, as I touched upon in many other videos, and we're just going to cut across to when that's already been taken care of. At this point here, they're ready for installation. However, they're not going to be installed just yet because obviously the model needs to slide off at the paint. And with these things hanging outside the mantlet, you can see how that could be really difficult to work around. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a pin into installing these at the moment. And we'll circle back to them after everything is painted and weathered. But regardless, at least you get to see what they look like in their completed format. The units themselves are painted and weathered in the same format that I often touch upon in a number of other videos, specifically in regards to painting MGs. Only for this one here I use a slightly different method compared to what I mentioned like for instance in the Armor Packs M1919 video that I did a little while ago. For the paintwork, I actually started off with just standard El Cheapo flat black spray paint, and then I went ahead and gave it a wash of Tamiya NATO black. This was done to really replicate that grayish color that's generally seen on many parkerized weapons and for a post-World War II type system this is generally the type of coating that it would definitely have. The other option would have been roll with the Rust-Oleum dark gray primer that I've also mentioned in a few videos however at the moment I'm out of it and I'm also not really sure if that paint will have a reaction to the resin that these things are printed in for instance the HD material you can't paint with that paint it doesn't really like it so uh, for this one here I just played it safe so I started with just the El Cheapo stuff so the unit was painted black airbrush over with a wash of Tamiya NATO black and then I went ahead and just dry brush it to the format that you see here 
The dry brushing was done in the same exact method that I've mentioned in a number of other videos. And for the exact same reason. Once the dry brushing is added, it really gives the units a nice rich color to them and also really gives them that distressed look, which would be very typical on service weapons. Also, with the units being painted and weathered, you really get to appreciate the integrally printed on details that I was mentioning earlier. So, back to the receiver section. On the trigger pad over there, you get to see the knurling. Note the shroud with the inner barrel detailing, as well as also the wrench slit areas. On the uh, muzzle section, you get to see the powder fouling. This was done with the airbrush, and it's done with, to me, just flat black. After the other weathering is completed, of course. With the charging handle no longer in the way, you get to see the inner bulk carrier group detailing. As well as the other stamping detailing which is present on the printing. There goes that chain charging handle which I mentioned before. As well as the feed ways. And feed paw detailing. The other unit is the exact same type of setup but it's a mirror image as I touched upon before. And here's the turret fully assembled as well as with the inside completely painted. There are a few other details that still need to be added. However, these will be touched upon in a future update video. But regardless, what you see here is basically what you're going to get. So first, I just want to show the exterior sections. As you see, the mantlet is in place right now and it does go up and down when the paint isn't sticky, of course. But as you can see, it's all set. That crack that I mentioned before has been completely blended in the use of some super glue and a little bit of wet sanding here or there. I still need to add the eyelets. These are something that I am going to be adding by the next update. I actually have a set in 3D print right now. As soon as they come in from my printer, I'll go ahead and drop them in place and the detailing is all set on the exterior. And we can see that the hatch has been installed as well. The unit is fully functional. However, it can't open right now and that's because it's actually locked in place with the lock lever like it would on the actual unit. To get access to the lock lever, I'm just going to go ahead and rotate the unit around where you can also get a nice glimpse of the interior. And if anyone has seen a real V100 armor car, you should definitely be getting some deja vu. So as I mentioned before, the interior is about 99% completed. What is absent is the lens the rubber eye cup, as well as also the rubber backrest. Another component that is missing is the lever over here, which controls the twin M73s. However, that's actually a blessing right now because that can't be fitted in place at this time because that needs to be added after the M73s are slid into location. And then the piece just plugs into this little hole over here, thus completing the look. Of course, all this is going to be circled back to towards the end of the project when, you know, it comes time to start fitting all these pieces of equipment in permanently. However, outside of that, the remainder of the interior is complete. So starting with the actual majority of the paintwork itself, you'll see that the inside is painted with the legendary seafoam green. For the color, just like I mentioned on my 135th scale models, this here is Tamiya Sky. Tamiya Sky is a fantastic color and it closely resembles the seafoam green which is found on real military vehicles. The entire universe was of course spray painted in flat black, again to act as a primer, then the entire interior portion here was painted with the Tamiya Sky. This was applied via the airbrush. After the sky was added, it then was time to go ahead and meticulously paint all the small little bits of equipment that need to be painted differently from the standard base coat. The largest thing to point out first is the turret rotation ring. As you can see, the face of the ring here is painted in a silver or a dulled steel color, which again greatly resembles the real unit that I personally saw. For the color, I went with Vallejo Oily Steel for that. It's an acrylic paint, so it applies on very easily. And it's also impervious to the Paneline Accent, which was definitely added to all of the appropriate locations that are present. 
You need to use an acrylic for that because if you use a enamel, that stuff is made out of a turpentine based solution and it will just cause the turpentine paint to just, or I should say the enamel paint, to run amok and you definitely don't want that. So regardless, uh, I used again the Vallejo for that. The Vallejo does a really good job with giving you that dull steel color which is again true to form to the real example that I did research. On the inside paint we're here, the other thing to point out are the little pads that secure or which will secure the bulletproof glass in place. This is true to form to the real one with the color that they are, and this is painted on both the inside and the exterior. Of course, you will be seeing this section here through the prisms when they are added in the next video or two updates. This here is nothing but, to me, a flat black that's used on that. You can also see here the little pad found on the rotation system. Again, just to me, a flat black was applied with the paintbrush to the appropriate rotations. Probably the hardest, the trickiest paintwork is to get into all these little careful areas over here and specifically to do so to avoid any sort of brush slipping on you, but most importantly, to also prevent any sort of running. At something like this, this is where the paint consistency needs to be on point. Too thick, it'll be too clunky, too thin, it runs all over the place and neither of which are something that you want to deal with. On the... Optic over here, I actually went ahead and painted the Allen wrench. Hopefully I could come out in, on screen right now, but right over here you can see that it looks like an L that's sideways. Well, that's the Allen wrench, and that was very meticulously painted with probably one of the best paintbrushes I have in order to do that procedure. And luckily this is 1-6 scale, because if it was smaller it would be basically impossible to get that painted, but here we are. I also went ahead and painted the cylinder over here, to which I'm not really sure what it does, like I may have mentioned before, but I was utilizing photographs of the real one that I took at the show and basically emulated as much as possible. The knob is gloss black, as it's a shiny plastic material found on the real unit, and then the wire was added that emerges from the section over here, snakes around, and then enters onto this little what looks like a push button device right there on the side of the optic and that too was painted in black to better replicate the rubber material that it is made out of. On the mantlet over here, the two mounts for the M73s as well as the arm is painted with the same color that I used for the canister and if memory serves I used Kerr Gray, which is again a Tamiya acrylic and these were all painted via the paintbrush. Again, consistency is going to be key. The arm will also be painted the same color once it eventually comes in from the printer. For the hatch, well this is something that's slightly different in paintwork compared to the remainder of the units, but before I do that, I also want to mention the backrest that we have right here. To me a flat black, paintbrush applied. And it was actually not too bad trying to paint. Again, you want to be really careful in the back section over here, where you only want to paint the rest and not the brackets or the roof itself. But if you take your time and you got some good paintbrushes and the paint's at the right consistency, yeah, you know, it, it does actually a short work of the job. Oh, on this section over here, you can see the hatch knob right over there. This was painted first with flat black with spray paint. I painted the stem silver. It's going to be tricky to see on camera to look like the threaded screw section right over there. And then a little brushing of Tamiya gloss clear was added Give it that little plasticky sheen that we see here. It's the same type of painting procedure that I did on that knob that I mentioned before. On the real unit, this would be used to lock the hatch in its open position. As I may have mentioned before, there's a little notch right over here, and you can see the boss emerging from the rear portion of the turret, and there is actually a section of the fastener protruding. On the real unit, you would open up the hatch, and just rotate this knob here, which would then have its threaded section lock into that recess in the hatch, which would keep this thing firmly secured in the open position. For the reason I may have touched upon before, so when you're driving around, you're sticking your head out of the turret, you know, you don't have this thing to slam on you, which would definitely ruin your day. For the paintwork up here, this is actually Rust-Oleum Olive Drab spray paint, uh, and I've utilized this color on these various interior components found on the vehicle, namely the inner tracks, or I'm sorry, the inner hatch sections, and then it was painted and weathered with the 
types of airbrush washing and dry brushing that I generally mention. Because this is an enamel, you do not want to use the Tamiya Paneline Accent on this. It will definitely not be a good day for you. Paneline Accent was definitely utilized on the remainder of the interior though, along with counter shading with the airbrush. And then the dry brushing was done to give you the weather chipping effect that you do see here. On this portion of the hatch, you can see the lever is fully functional. And one thing that's really cool is the little strap that I have right here. And this I fabricated out of some small thin ribbon that I had on hand. Went ahead, painted it with a duller color because it's kind of like an, a, a leprechaun green, which is not really what you want. In fact, I got the ribbon right over here. There we go. So yeah, I had this stuff on hand. Yeah, obviously this is not going to look great, but I went ahead and painted it with Tamiya Olive Green, which really did a good job with dulling it out immensely. Then I weathered it with some Paneline Accent just to give it that dirty look that you see here. I went ahead and bent the stuff into a loop, glued it in a closed position like this, and then I fastened the little clip over here out of just some small little metal wire, which does the job absolutely perfectly, and it really does fill in the remainder of the detailing here found on the hatch. And it's also a convenient way to close the hatch as you would in real life. Another thing that is currently absent at the moment is the retention ring. This I actually went ahead and redesigned compared to the way I originally intended for use on this model. And this is something that is currently in print. As soon as it comes in, you'll see exactly what it looks like. But fortunately, I can progress with the model into paint without this component in place because, you know, needless to say, this is something that needs to be added after everything is already painted and weathered. And this turret here is about to be fitted to the vehicle in a permanent manner. So more information on that is definitely to come. As is the plastic, the clear plastic prisms here for the interior and exterior portions of the periscopes. And we also have coming the little locking tabs, which would be fitted to these areas over here. And these details will complete the look of the periscopes once completed. And it's basically a similar type of detailing that's found on the hull periscopes as well. But again, more on this is to come. And here's a view I know that a lot of you guys who've been watching this series from the beginning have been eagerly awaiting to see the turret on the model with the armament fitted in place. Now the armament is only placed on temporarily. It's just slid into the locations and are not glued on yet at this time for the reasons that I mentioned before. But you really get a good idea on exactly what the unit's gonna look like in its completed state. And it definitely blows all my expectations out of the water. With the camera off the tripod, you get a better glimpse at the interior. Sadly, I wish I had that eye cup right here because that's a really cool bit of detailing. But alas, this is something that will definitely be circled back to when the component does finally arrive. And once the remainder of the, the equipment is fit in place, it's going to just make the unit just scream. But until then, you know, it, we're just going to have to look at what we have, which is, you know, nothing to sneeze at. We have a nice chunk of the interior basically finished, as I mentioned before. So with the turret work finally completed, more or less, the next thing I need to do, and it's the last bit of detail needs to be scratch built on the model's hull to finally get this thing ready for painting, and that is with a guard that's going to be fitted to the rear portion of the hull. On the V100 armor car, originally when the vehicles were first built, they were in this type of format where they were slick and there was nothing really back here. However, after the units started to be fielded and after the crew started utilizing them in field, some shortcomings, or I should say not sh necessarily shortcomings, but some enhancements were definitely requested to be made. And one of which was a guard that was fabricated to be mounted in this area over here. The purpose of that guard is to protect the gunner, which would be found in the rear crew hatch as I touched upon in the last video. This area here was eventually turned into a gunner's position, which if I pan the camera over, you will see that's exactly what I did to this example over here. And it's not really, uh, shall we say, polite to have dual M73s that are live and firing being able to freely pivot and, you know, muzzle sweep you. Not exactly something that you want to have, you know, in your day. So in order to prevent this from happening, they went ahead and did pretty much what you saw on the World War II PT boats, where they had this wrought iron guard fixed in this position here so that if the gunner is engaging the enemy and it's just, you know, losing track of what 
is going on in his surroundings. He can rotate the turret, but now instead of the barrel's muzzle sweeping any personnel on the back, it's going to hit that guard over there and prevent any problems from that happening. So those units are going to be fabricated on this model over here. To do this, I'm going to do this the old-fashioned, old-school manufacturing way. It's going to be fabricated all out of brass. For the brass rod, I'll be utilizing k and 332nd brass. This stuff can be found basically any hobby shop. And for the metric inclined, I have no idea what this is in Euro numbers. But, you know, this stuff can easily be found in, you know, basically any online search from k and Direct. Or I'm pretty sure you can also pick the stuff up off of Amazon. They have basically everything. So, uh, with that out of the way, the only thing I need to do now is I'm going to compare and contrast photographs of the real unit that I examined and I'm going to plot the points where exactly this thing's got to go from there I'm basically going to fabricate the exact same way it was done in real life mark the points bend the rod to shape and then I'm going to just solder it all together obviously the real ones would have been welded but you know soldering on a one six scale model definitely gives you a good imitation of that shall we say and well let's go ahead and cut across to when we have progressed further on this bit of detailing so here's the frame now basically put in place I had to carefully mark the locations with a pencil just to make sure everything is nice and square and the piece is centered appropriately. Drilled out the holes, drilled them out to the exact diameter of the brass rod that I'm using, and then I went ahead and bent everything to shape. When you're bending it to shape, you want to make sure everything is even and also everything is symmetrical or as symmetrical as it possibly can be. And once it's in place, I then glued it into the location that you see here. The last thing to do is add the support strut, which is right over here. As you can see, the hole has already been drilled out. Here's the, the support strut here. I'm going to align it. And then at this point here, I'm going to go ahead and do the soldering. For something like this, glues really are not going to hold and you really need to do soldering. Soldering is the best way to do it. I'll leave that in. Uh, soldering is the best way to do it and it basically more or less welds the thing together and it keeps it strong for years to come. For the soldering, I'm going to utilize my soldering iron. This is the best way to do it. it. Gives you a nice pinpoint precise area where the heat's going to be applied. And it's going to allow the solder to flow into just the right location. If you try to use something like a pen torch, this can be done, but it's a little bit more haphazard. Also, in case anyone's wondering, it's not going to be any problem to the plastic model. Obviously, heat and plastic don't exactly mix because the amount of heat is going to be so centralized in one small location that the plastic is not going to get nearly to the point where it can cause an issue. For the solder, I'm utilizing my typical uh, material, which is just, you know, rosin core electrical solder. And if you're doing any sort of soldering, flux is going to be an absolute must. I just use basic uh, plumbing flux like you see here, and this is the type of stuff that I utilize on all of my builds whenever I'm doing any sort of soldering. And yes, I even utilize this stuff on my electronics and it works just fine. So. From here, let's go ahead and actually do the soldering job. I gotta first plug this thing in and wait for it to heat up. Oh, and by the way, in case anyone's wondering, this soldering iron here was procured off of Amazon, and uh, these actually work pretty well. I've had some pretty good res uh, results with them. Alright, so with the soldering done, the piece is now rock solid. I also went ahead and wiped down the area over here with a little bit of turpentine. This was just done to remove any sort of flux that remains. The flux is definitely not something that you want to have on the surface because it can inhibit the paint when it does get time to get this thing painted. But it's now ready to go. I am going to take some thin super glue, just add it to this section over here just to add a little bit of glue, making it nice and sturdy. And I'm just going to reinforce the other two with glue as well. After that, I'm going to go ahead and sculpt on some well beads and, well, presto, we're good to go. And after a little bit of sculpting with some epoxy, you can see how the unit looks like fully completed with the weld sculpted in place. The welds were not just added to this section over here, but they were also added to the side view mirror mounts found on either side here of the front of the model. This was the last of the sculpting work that was required in order to get this model ready for painting. And before I put the new turret in place, I do want to give a brief shout out to the original turret that this model did have. This is the turret right here that was supplied on the model when I first got it. As I mentioned in the original video for this project here, 
the hull was started by another customizer about 20 years ago. He was sitting on it for the longest period of time, and then he went ahead and sold it to me, to which then I got it and built it up to the condition that we see here. Well, in addition to the hull, he also built the turret, and this here is more or less the original turret. It has definitely been around the block a few times, but you get an idea of what the original turret looked like. It's all styrene construction. He did a decent job of getting it to the appropriate proportions, and for the material that it's fabricated, it's actually pretty good. And this was basically indicative of the era that this model was manufactured in. During this time, 3D printing was definitely not a thing, and we all had to cobble things together from th materials like styrene, plywood, and other materials of the sorts. So it's really amazing that we went in a relatively short period of time from quality like this to things like this. And if anyone has been cruising around the 1-6 scale community forums and Facebook pages, you'll basically see that 3D printing is more or less the future of this hobby. One last thing I do want to mention about the original component over here before I relegate it to the spare parts bin is that the designer who designed and built this component over here, for the most part, got the component in the ballpark in terms of scale. In fact, I actually utilized this one here as a starting point when I was designing the 3D printed counterpart that you see fitted to this model. And to be perfectly fair, at the moment this one here still has its eyelets and this one here does not, but that's something that's gonna be remedied shortly after the filming of this video. Needless to say, with the turret now on hand, painted, built, and fitted to the model, as well as with that guard fabricated and fitted as well. This model here, exterior detailing wise, is complete. That's right. This model here is now ready for painting. With the eyelets notwithstanding, but uh, I'll be mentioning that <laughs> in the next video. Outside of that small little fitting, this model here can now go ahead and slide off into paint, which means completion is definitely something that is in the very near future. Anyone who's a fan of this channel and who definitely follows my 1-6 scale work will tell you that when a 1-6 scale model hits this point over here, it's basically on a rocket sled all the way to the finish line. And that means that the days of this model sitting on top of this table, on top of this styrofoam block here, are definitely limited. And with all that comes a lot more content in a shorter duration of time. So if you're into this project over here, you're definitely going to be happy within the next two or three weeks. However, as my catchphrase generally goes, that's best left up for another video for another day. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for the 1-6 scale Cadillac Gauge V100 Armor Car, also known as the M706. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1-6 scale project update videos like this one over here, or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop and new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted all the way from the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.